You're in the water loop. <laughs> Waterloop is a nonprofit media outlet made possible in part by a grant from Springpoint Partners. For all content, visit waterloop.org. This is episode number 149, Flooding on a Sunny Day. Some coastal communities experience flooding of low-lying areas on sunny days due to exceptional high tides. The frequency and severity of these events, also called blue sky flooding or nuisance flooding, are increasing due to sea level rise and are projected to triple in the U.S. by the year 2050. Sunny day flooding is discussed in this episode with Mayuki Hino, an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina. Mayuki explains a variety of the current research on the flooding, including her work in coastal North Carolina, and how the information is used to understand trends and help communities adapt. She also explains some of the response measures such as retrofitting infrastructure, using nature-based solutions, and following managed retreat from flood-prone areas. The conversation will begin in one minute, but first a word about our sponsor, Varuna. Waterloop. This episode of Waterloop is sponsored by Varuna, the decision intelligence tool for water systems. The factors that go into running water systems are more dynamic than ever, but the tools for making decisions are still static. That's why Varuna built a resilience tool that uncovers blind spots, identifies risks, and generates insights, which are all presented in a user-friendly dashboard. There are many risks that water systems have to mitigate. While EPA identifies 10 vectors of risks that water utilities should track, the Varuna resilience tool captures 26, including internal and external risks. The tool allows operators to take immediate actions and leaders to make long-term strategic decisions and is especially helpful for for smaller systems. With Varuna, better data means better decisions. Learn more at varuna.city and let them know you heard about it on Waterloop. You're in the Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. Here for this episode with Dr. Mayuki Hino. She is an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina, uh, st- you know, specializing in a lot of things, including environmental planning, land use, climate change, sea level rise, the intersection of all of those things. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Happy to be here. So want to talk about sunny day flooding. Uh, there's a, a number of different terms people use for this. Uh, blue sky flooding. Sometimes people say nuisance flooding, maybe high tide flooding. But I think like blue sky flooding, sunny day flooding are, are kind of what we're getting at here. Um, what is sunny day flooding? So sunny day flooding is flooding that happens when the water level in the bay or in the ocean is just so high that it spills over the bulkheads, it comes up through the storm drains and into the street. The reason we call it sunny day flooding or blue sky flooding is because it can happen with no hurricane in sight, not even a drop of rain, uh, but you'll be standing in four inches of water in the street. Um, because it's just because the water levels were high, whether that's due to a particularly high tide or because the winds were blowing in a certain direction and pushing up the water levels where you are. Mm. And why is this a problem? I think that people are hearing more about this. You, uh, you hear it more in the media, you see it more on social media, this, this sunny day flooding. Um, why is it a problem? Yeah, I think especially with one of the terms that is often used for this, which is nuisance flooding, um, people think it's no big deal. You know, there's water in the streets for a couple of hours and then it goes away and who cares? It's not like you got hit by a hurricane and you have to rebuild your house. But the thing with sunny day flooding is it happens much more often than hurricanes or those types of big catastrophic floods. There are places that are flooding dozens of days per year, even now, And so the real challenge is that all of a sudden you wake up and maybe you can't commute to work because the road is is inundated or uh, the school bus is coming two hours later um, so that the water levels are low enough that they can get to your neighborhood and back to school. And these disruptions happen routinely. uh, So they really add up over the course of, of a year or multiple years. 
they're a really different type of disruption than those hurricanes, these big floods we tend to think about. But those nuisances really add up to be uh, more than a nuisance in the end. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I used to live in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, we talked about this off podcast. Uh, and uh, that's one of the places in the country where this flooding is really prevalent uh, and a problem. And, and in the downtown city dock area, uh, there was sunny day flooding events and I would get notices from my uh, children's school that I'd have to, you know, that this road is flooded out. You got to go a different way. It was a, it was a nuisance. It was an inconvenience. It added, you know, five minutes <laughs> to my drive, but it still, you know, was impacting that area there in Annapolis. And I know that also it's having an economic impact on businesses that are down there. And then this is ha playing out in other communities. Um, is sunny day flooding increasing? And if so, why? It is definitely increasing and it's because of sea level rise. So if you think back to when some of these coastal communities first started to put down serious infrastructure like roads and drainage pipes and so forth, they set it all at an elevation that would be high enough to stay dry most of the time. Um, so let's say that way back in 1700s, the 1800s, uh, it was high enough that that road, you know, that even on the highest tide of the year, there were six inches of clearance between the road and the water level. Well, sea levels globally are now about eight inches higher than they were back then. And so now on that high tide of the year, you're underwater by two inches instead of clear six inches. Um, so we know that sea level rise is contributing to the frequency of these floods. Um, the most recent projections suggest that the frequency will on average triple between now and 2050 in the U.S. Um, and so more and more, uh, the infrastructure that we've built in the past uh, is losing that buffer zone because the normal sea levels are getting higher and higher. So deviations from higher tides or strong winds, whatever it may be, are pushing water levels above what infrastructure was designed for more and more. Mm. A tripling of, of the frequency. That's amazing because in a number of places, like you mentioned, this is happening with a pretty good frequency already. And, and if you triple that, it's going to become really a problem. Um, and then the sea level rise is obviously continuing to rise, which is going to going to drive that. So that's why this is becoming a concern. Um, could you talk a little bit about where this is happening around the United States? Maybe where some of the hot spots are. Yeah, I think um, to be clear, sea levels are going up everywhere. Um, local sea levels. Um, might be rising faster in some places than others. And that's due to a lot of local characteristics, like the topography of the region and whether kind of the ground is shifting up or down slowly over time. Um, so there are some places in the U.S. where already infrastructure was relatively close to sea level and sea levels are rising quite quickly. So those tend to be um, the hot spots that we think about for this type of sunny day flooding. And lots of those places in the U.S. are along the uh, Atlantic and Gulf coasts. So the U.S. Southeast in particular is a place where we're seeing pretty high uh, frequencies already. Um, and uh, we know that uh, when we think about New England and the West Coast, those numbers are certainly going up over time as well. Uh, but places where you hear about this a lot are places like Annapolis that has come up already, um, Charleston, South Carolina as well, Miami Beach, which is one of the first places that really invested a lot in, in responding to this, um, spots in, in Louisiana as well. Um, so we do see lots of, kind of concern and reactions um, in the, the southeast part of the U.S. already, but we know it's increasingly going to be a problem everywhere. What, what's happening around the country to understand this flooding better? Um, you know, what are you familiar with? And then maybe also talk about some of your work uh, in, in North Carolina. Sure. So I think there's a lot of people working on this uh, and a, a number of, of oceanographers and coastal scientists are trying to generate better models of how high water levels are going to be along the coast and how frequently moving forward as sea levels rise. 
So we have more and more sophisticated projections of uh, what the tide gauge in Wilmington, North Carolina is going to say um, in 2050, for instance. Uh, and that's taking into account lots of different forces um, that are going to affect the tide and, and how the water levels are shifting over time. Um, one of the challenges, or I shouldn't say challenges, I think one of the um, places where that research kind of stops and where our work picks up um, is that it's really helpful to know what the water levels at the tide gauge are going to be, but often that's slightly different than what people are experiencing. Um, and that could be because people in many instances live far away from a tide gauge, so they might be flooding more or less than the tide gauge might indicate. Um, it's also because local infrastructure plays a really significant role in affecting whether or not you actually flood. Um, so what my team is doing, I um, co-lead a team with Dr. Catherine Inardi, who's at NC State, um, and we're trying to measure flooding directly on roadways rather than thinking about what the water level is um, in the bay or in the ocean. We're saying, is there water uh, in the stormwater drainage infrastructure and on the street and how often. Um, and so we have uh, custom sensors that we put out in storm drains, and we've done this in a, a couple of communities across North Carolina, and those can tell us when the drainage system is impaired. Um, so when water levels are, are high enough that they're flowing backwards into the drainage system instead of rain going out the other direction, um, and they can tell us when water gets onto the roadway and just how deep it is on the roadway. Um, and so that's been really useful for giving us these uh, really precise measures of frequency that might deviate from what that tide gauge is reading. Mm -hmm. And as you know, scientists and others are studying sunny day flooding, um, what's happening with that information? Who's interested in that information? <laughs> um, so I think it can be used for a couple of different purposes. So in, in some of our, our partner communities, their uh, emergency management and public works teams are responsible for closing down the roadways or being the person that notifies the school that they've got to tell all their parents <laughs> to go a different way to get to, to pick up that day. Um, and sometimes they're taken by surprise. They don't know that it's going to flood that day and all of a sudden there's water on the street and they're too late and so forth. Um, people might get stranded, stall their cars. And so uh, in the short term, there's this um, public safety benefit to knowing exactly exactly what's going on when. Um, I think in the long term, um, and particularly uh, what we're trying to do, which is also gather information from um, community members and residents about what they're experiencing, how it's disrupting their lives and, and their preferences about how to respond and solutions is um, to help communities evaluate what could we do about this? How is the frequency going to change over time? Um, and uh, what might be effective ways of, of managing this? And so it could be um, that some type of retrofitting of infrastructure is going to be really effective and useful in the long term. Um, in other instances, it might be that they say, well, like we've got... Um, a couple of, of parcels here that are already vacant, and maybe we actually want to use this as a wetland to absorb some of that water and soak up some of that wave energy in the long term, since we know that it's going to flood more and more often. Um, and so it's communities around the US and, and really around the world are thinking about how to cope with rising sea levels. It's information about where is it flooding? How often? Why? How is that going to change in the future? Um, can help them develop plans that are really going to respond to this type of chronic flood occurrence, um, not just focusing on the hurricanes or the bigger events that they've been planning for or kind of have mm. been a threat for a long time. Mm. Yeah, great, great examples. You know, we, you mentioned Miami Beach earlier, and I think I saw a story, I don't know, a year or so ago, where they're even, you know, changing some of their local land use codes or their building codes, um, even to maybe try to encourage not having critical infrastructure on the first floor, or even really, that first floor is almost a wash. Uh, and you, you know, you start your business and activities second floor up because the water's the water's coming. Um, 
people can look that up at Miami Beach and you, you see so many examples of sunny day flooding there. Um, another community I think about a lot is like the, is Norfolk and the whole Hampton Roads, Chesapeake, Virginia area. They're, they're really uh, facing a lot with sea level rise and I think sunny day flooding too in that, that low lying area. Um, I was going to also ask about this concept of managed retreat. Um, I think it's something I, when I was reading about your work, something mentioned in there a little bit, and it's a fascinating concept. It's the idea like, you know what, the sea level is rising. We're getting flooding, getting water on, on a normal basis. Should we just pull back our development from these areas? Could you talk about that concept of managed retreat as a response to sunny day flooding? Yeah, I think it has it has been used in response to lots of different natural hazards and mm. uh, in coastal areas as a response to sunny day flooding is certainly um, uh, one response to think about and to consider. Um, we think a lot about reducing risk by, um, you know, building new structures that prevent water from getting to where we care about, right? We build these seawalls and we elevate our houses and so forth. And another way to keep water out of the places we care about is to move the stuff that we care about. Um, so that area can flood, but we're not worried about it flooding because there are no people, there are no structures in harm's way. It's not, um, I would say, it's it's a complicated thing to think about and to do, right? Because we're not used to really thinking about pulling back from places that we've already developed. Um, but I, I think that uh, it's something that increasingly communities can at least consider and evaluate, does this make sense in any of the locations around us? Um, if yes, you know, what would it take to do it in a way that felt like the people were benefiting, the environment's benefiting and risk is being reduced? Um, and that's not going to be the answer everywhere, certainly. Um, but I think because we know so much about how sea levels are going to rise and how risk is going to change in the future, um, we know that a decision to stay in place is a decision to continue um, trying to manage where the water is going for decades and decades to come. Mm. And this is one type of intervention where uh, you can do it once. And it might be effective for a very, very long time in terms of reducing risk. Yeah, no, great, great point. It's it. There is controversy to it, or, or a lot of sensitivity, I should say. That's a better word, right? The idea of, mm -hmm. of giving up where we live or where we work and, and having to relocate is a tough concept for sure. Um, well, when it comes to, to North Carolina here, where, where we both are, uh, you've got this research happening in, in a couple different communities. Um, what's what's kind of next for you? Where where are you going with that research, and and what more do you hope comes from that? Or what are you what are you planning next? Yeah, I think so. We've already been um, we've already been really uh, surprised to some extent by the frequency of flooding in the communities that we're working in. It was actually higher than we anticipated it would be before we started. Um, and so the near term next steps for us are starting some of that community engaged. Um, research that I mentioned earlier. So um, we're going to start doing surveys of people who live in those places and interviewing local officials about um, where do where can our information help inform what they're doing? What barriers do they see to adapting? You know, what types of solutions um, might make sense to them in the future? Um, I think uh, thinking really big picture. Um, in the long term is, you know, not just thinking about how this is happening in North Carolina, but thinking about it on bigger geographies, right? This, of course, is not a unique uh, situation to towns in North Carolina. And also thinking about the way that individuals are responding themselves. So are people just up and moving, right? Are people just getting frustrated with what's going on and saying, I'm going to go live on the other side of town where this street doesn't flood every day or, or Every day is an exaggeration, but you know, every Very month, often. yeah, um, right. Um, or are they taking other protective measures to um, to reduce the impacts of those things? Are they uh, parking their car in a different spot 
every high tide, right? Those types of, of responses. Um, and so what we want to do is, is be able to um, characterize the physical system well. So where's the water going? Why? How often? But also the human experience of it and ways that individuals and communities are responding um, so that we can really paint the whole picture of the impacts of sea level rise that we're already seeing and what adaptation might look like. Mm, incredible. Well, thank you for coming on here and talking about sunny day flooding, blue sky flooding, whatever whatever we call it here. Um, I definitely, as a North Carolina resident, I look forward to following uh, a coastal resident, following your work here. Uh, one of those you know places you're studying is just about 15 minutes from my house. So, um, but anyway, thank you so much for all the information and perspective. Thank you for having me. It was a fun conversation. Waterloo. Thank you for listening to the podcast and thank you to this episode's sponsor, Varuna. To find all episodes, sign up for email updates and connect on social media, visit waterloop.org. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop.